Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. This is the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Caroline, this is week two of um, your most anticipated series. And last week we were saying it would be a two-part series, (laughs) um, but it looks like it has... As I suspected, listeners, uh, ballooned into um, more of a three-part epic. Yeah, I know we originally said this would be two parts, uh, but just going through all of the information, I think we really want to give due diligence to all the various hearings and the actual trials involved, as well as giving coverage to all of the victims. Um, A lot of the time we tend to see just a... A list of names with the Salem Witch Trials, but not a lot of detail or context. So we would like to change that, especially since this is such an important topic to me. And (laughs) I would say considering how um, unique I am, it's really a there but for the grace of God go I sort of situation. Born in the right century. I certainly was, yes. (laughs) We left off last week at the end of the first interrogation in the Salem Witch Trials, the week-long hearing regarding Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tichuba. All three women were sent to jail to await their official trials, and Tichuba, the slave of Samuel Paris, the minister of Salem Village, had confessed that she had not only signed the Devil's Book and taken part in acts of witchcraft— but she had seen Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne take part as well. And according to the other signatures she'd seen in the Devil's Book, there were other witches in town, too, hiding among everyone else. That catches us up to where we are. And again, Tichuba's just basically terrorized into giving this false confession, right? I think she starts to realize that this confession... Um, is going to be her way out of getting killed. It's this weird thing where all the people who say they're not guilty are killed. But the people who say, yeah, no, I'm a witch, I did it. And uh, here's who else are witches. Yeah, it's that's important. very strange. But that's a, that's a key part of it, right? Is I'm a witch yes. and also these people. Giving, giving names is very important. And that kind of eggs on the whole thing. Now, before we get into this week's episode, I just want to remind everyone that this series is brought to you by Things to Do in Salem.com, your one stop shop for planning any visit to the Witch City. And hopefully, after this series, you'll be dying to visit. Um, Do they still have that exhibit at the museum there with all the original documents that they got, like on loan from Harvard or whatever? Yeah, that was at the Peabody Essex the last time I went with you, which was the spring, right? Mm-hmm. April-ish. I think that was a limited time exhibit because a lot of those <laughs> exhibits, um, <laughs> where it's like the documents, there was some furniture and stuff, those were on loan from like a bunch of different locations. But there is one there currently that has to do with like artwork inspired by the trials and stuff. But yeah, the, it's not really um, the kind of thing where there's a lot of contemporary things still in Salem that you can go see. But this uh, this was like original arrest records and stuff that they had on loan from Harvard. It was uh, it was pretty sweet. Yeah, it was very interesting. And we'll be referring to some of those warrants and transcripts in this episode. So Sarah Good was sent to Ipswich Jail, where Constable Joseph Herrick worked, who happened to be a relative of Sarah's, and I guess they figured he would be better to watch her? Though one could also imagine that she was a flight risk, and Herrick would have more interest than not in helping her. That's Logic was weird in these times. It was often non-existent. Um... Tichuba and Sarah Osborne went to the Salem jail, on whose site in modern-day Salem, a very haunted apartment and office building now sits. So, if any of our listeners would like to go visit, and presumably you'd see this area anyway on just about any ghost tour you may take in Salem, it's across from St. Peter's Episcopal Church. And uh, near the mall and all that stuff. And and this is the one that every ghost tour will take you past and go like, never rent there, right? Well, yeah. 
it's like a condo complex and there's also office buildings and there's always for rent signs there. Do you think the other landlords in town like pay the ghost store guys <laughs> to go like never this building? Uh, it would be a good racket to have. So at this point, a couple of men left for Boston to request assistance in the trials, and we've barely made it to a few days into March of 1692. But March would, however, bring more accusations on top of the original three. Now, what's the mechanism here? Do people, like, just see this is going on and go, you know who I don't like? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that. In, in the guise of these accusations and the girls having fits and stuff. But as we'll see in this episode, a lot of it is tied into politics and interpersonal issues between families. So after the first hearing, other town people met at the home of William Griggs, the doctor who was supposedly a rational thinker, but had also first put forth the possibility that witchcraft was afoot. Griggs had um, bailed on Salem and then come back, right? Or am I thinking of a different guy? You're thinking of a different guy. You're thinking of Reverend George Burroughs, which yes. will come back into the story soon. Griggs, um, yeah, he, he, you would think that he was a little more logical, but he was also the one that was like, oh, I don't know. I can't really explain why these girls are having these seizures. Might be a witch. Probably a witch. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the 17th century doctor. Mm-hmm. Griggs's niece, Elizabeth Hubbard, lived in the home as a servant and was one of the original accusers. She was present for this meeting, and perhaps because she now had a fresh audience, Elizabeth began to have a fit, saying an invisible specter was tormenting and hurting her. She pointed to a space where no one was and stated that the specter was Sarah Good, standing naked on the table. Oh, nasty slut, she yelled. Wow. <laughs> Salty language from mm -hmm. this nine-year-old. I don't know if she... I think she was a teenager. Um, and Samuel Sibley, the husband of Mary Sibley, who you might remember from last episode, had asked Tichuba to make the witch cake, which had started this whole mess. The dog piss cake. Yeah. So Samuel swung his walking stick at the empty spot. And Elizabeth exclaimed, you have hit her right across the back. No one could see anything. Right across the titties it was. <laughs> now, remember how Sarah Good was being taken to Ipswich Jail? Uh, you, how? I don't remember the conveyance. I don't remember like what no, kind of... No, just remember that she was. Oh, yeah, of course. So she was staying at the... She was staying the night at Herrick's barn at this moment... Now, I'm not sure if the barn was the actual jail or just a stop on the journey. It's a little confusing in the text. But when another... It, it, towns were so young and so new yeah. and so small at this time, it could have been both, right? <laughs> Pretty much. That's why I'm confused by it. Another guard, not Herrick, went to check on her in the barn, and he was dumbfounded to find that she had made an escape, leaving behind her shoes and stockings. But this is a bad decision, Sarah. I don't understand the reasoning of leaving behind the shoes because... Well, just escaping, I think, is a bad idea. They're going to... Where are you going? Escaping in this situation would probably not be a bad idea, to be honest. But the way she did what? it was just not helpful at all to her. But where is she supposed to go? Like, in Boston, wouldn't people know where she, who she was? Is she supposed to just go into the wilderness and fend for herself? We'll get into some of the other escapes. But needless to say... It's not very easy to travel Massachusetts trails in March with bare feet. So she was quickly found, and a gash was discovered on her arm. It was almost like she had been struck by something. You mean like a cane in the like tits? Like a wire. <laughs> well, the thing is, she had been said to have been struck in the back, not the tits, and this gash was on the arm, but, you know, it seemed Close like <laughs> yeah, it seemed like evidence. It's like, well, same person. There's a lot of things in this case that seem like they might be evidence. It gets worse and worse. The condition of the original afflicted girls somewhat improved around this time, perhaps the hysteria having been satisfied by some visible punishment. 
Ann Putnam Jr., though, continued to be tormented by what she said were two specters, and she identified one of these as Dorcas or Dorothy Good. Right. We we talked about that lamentable name last time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of accounts will call her Dorothy. I think it's a version of Dorothy that's <laughs> happily out of style. Dorcas. Dorcas. This is the four-year-old daughter of Sarah Good. She was four years old, the youngest person jailed for witchcraft during the trials, and I would hope the youngest person ever jailed in America. So scary. So scary, the idea that our youth could be these monsters in disguise. Oh, I was going to say, so scary that our youth could be put into jail. Oh, no. I think <laughs> if that kid is cast in spells, you gotta, you got to put her in, put her in her place. Putnam Jr. accused Dorcas of biting, pinching, and choking her. And though there's really not much a four-year-old can do to you, she <laughs> was arrested and interrogated. Interrogated? Mm hmm The interrogation, also carried out by the judges, quote-unquote, John Hawthorne and Jonathan Corwin, was a farce by any modern definition. Uh, Deo Dat Lawson... The former minister of Salem Vin Village. Who We've heard that name. Yes. Well, once you hear it, it's hard to forget. Um, he had returned to bear witness to the events, and he wrote of Dorcas's <laughs> examination. It's, it's a child, Carrie. Don't laugh. <laughs> Dorcas's. That's hilarious. He wrote of the examination that during the hearing, the afflicted complained they had often been bitten by this child and produced the marks of a small set of teeth. Accordingly, she was also committed to Salem prison. Some others also said they had not seen her so frequently appear to them to hurt them. Not frequently? They had not seen her so frequently appear. Yeah, it's old-timey language. I don't know. So the other witnesses were like, e but not the baby? I think it's more of a fact of like, yeah, I saw her once or twice. Not as much as these other girls. But like, we got to throw this baby in jail just to be safe. Well, they threw the baby in jail. Did um, the mother go to jail too? Yeah, that was Sarah Good. That was the right. one that had okay. just tried to escape. And she was pregnant as well. Sarah Good. Well, that's going to be another witch, so it's a good thing. We At least we know where that baby is. Hmm. The accusers of Dorcas Good included Mercy Lewis, a teenager, who stated that young Dorcas came to her and tried to force her to sign the devil's book. Again, the devil's book. It's going to be the big thing in this trial. Hot trend. Mm -hmm. Mary Walcott, 17 years old at the time, also said that Dorcas appeared to her to bite, pinch, and choke her, as with... And Putnam Jr. So, off to jail with this toddler. Biting and pinching is also like just all <clears throat> like baby behavior. Yes, but this is her specter appearing to them in the night. And so. her specter's just a little colicky. Pretty much. <laughs> Soon after, Betty Paris was sent away to live in Salem Town by her father and falls out of the transcripts pretty much completely. Good for her. Yeah, it's for the best. The three witches, Sarah's Good and Osborne, and Tichuba were again transferred to a Boston jail to await official trial. Then, Anne Putnam Jr. accused Martha Corey of witchcraft. And now we start getting into people not associated with the original three witches, and also people of higher standing in Salem Village. Okay, so how does that happen? Well, if you remember, uh, Putnam Jr. had seen two specters and had identified one as Dorcas Good. Now the other one had a name, too. Martha Corey was a surprising addition to the list because she was generally seen to be pious, attended church regularly, and was officially admitted to the Salem Village Church the year or two before. So she was a full covenanter. Well, <sighs> Okay. The Halfway Covenant debate. To sum up, the Halfway Covenant was a way for Puritans to try and increase and retain church attendance by, well, instead of forcing you to get up in front of the whole town to confess your sins, they created the option of meeting privately with your minister to do so, to do so like normal people. But Salem Village wasn't cool with that. No. Now, this would allow you to be able to access privileges like baptism and communion. And importantly, this would also be used as a free ticket to attend 
any Puritan church, whether they practice the halfway covenant or not. As you just mentioned, Salem Town Church was part of the wealthier town area, and they did practice the halfway covenant, but the Salem Village Church, the more rural and strictly religious church, refused to adopt the practice. And was was the difference really just what you said, just doing confession either in front of the co- congregation? That was or one not? of the main things. Yeah, I I can't find much more as to the the other differences. Whenever it's like this with the whole Protestant Reformation too, but you look at the stuff like the relatively incremental differences in worshiping the same God that people were like literally killing each other over. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just seems to echo again and again, doesn't it? Yeah. Martha's husband, Giles Corey, was accepted into the Salem Town Church, despite, well, he had a lot of issues. And this was ostensibly because he had privately atoned for his sins. But everyone just kind of hated him, uh, because he was an asshole, and for (laughs) other reasons I'm about to get into, but they couldn't prevent him from attending Salem Village Church, and this looked bad for Martha, too. Um, very litigious man was uh, Mr. Corey, right? Mm-hmm. Again, we're, we're just about to get into that. Now, Martha was a full member of the Salem Village Church and not a halfway covenanter, but she was seen as having forced her jerk husband into the pure church by virtue of her uh, well, virtue and oh. reputation. So he was a jerk and didn't want to do confession in front of all these other a holes. I think that was probably part of it. But with Martha, she was also publicly against the witch trials themselves, saying she didn't believe in witches or warlocks, and she had denounced them as well as denouncing denouncing the judges. Oh, so that's a little heretical, as well as you know. I don't know. These teen girls are probably in some hot water if it turns out witches aren't real. Uh, So they probably would like to uh, quiet that talk down. Yeah, this seemed to have ticked off the girls because Ann Putnam Jr., along with Mercy Lewis, leveled the next accusation against her. Now, as we said, Martha was married to Giles Corey, who, unlike her, was extremely disliked in the village. And this is why... And this is a but but uh, this is a stubborn man. This is a guy who's going to stand by his wife. Yeah. Well, then <laughs> wait. No. <laughs> Spoiler alert. No. But the main issue is in 1675, Giles had used a stick to severely beat a hired man of his by the name of J- Jacob Goodell. And this likely led to Jacob's death a few days later. Oh. He beat a man to death. In so many words, uh, the man didn't die right after the beating. So basically, the court just fined Corey because they couldn't find conclusively that the beating had led to Goodell's death. They're like, he didn't die from the beating. He died from all these bruises and internal (laughs) bleeding and broken bones. Basically, because, yeah, because it wasn't immediate, they couldn't say that this was it but it was obviously it it's not the fall that kills you it's the ground Mm. right um so most of the town felt that Corey had gotten off very lightly with no jail time for what they saw as murder a little earlier mary warren a servant of the proctor family had dipped a toe into the accusations by saying that she'd seen the specter of her employer john proctor flying around the house Flying around? Mm-hmm. Just around the house? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> what's, what's, what are you getting out of that? I I'd like to fly around the house. I don't know. But, I mean, you know, it's some, flying something you fantasize about when you have to walk somewhere, usually. <laughs> um, the idea that it, of just going like, boo, around <laughs> your own home is, uh, I don't know what John's getting out of that. Well, when he heard this, John, in so many words, told her to cut the shit or he'd beat her. And she did cut the shit until John left town soon after and her afflictions coincidentally returned. When the cat's away. You'll have seizures brought on by witches. (laughs) Exactly. That old chestnut. So how does this relate? Well, this time she accused Martha Corey, 
who she must have known because Martha's husband, Giles, and John Proctor, her employer, had had previous beef. Oh, you got to spill all that hot, steamy (laughs) beef. (laughs) Ew. Well, okay, so John and Elizabeth Proctor, his wife, they owned a tavern, and they chose to allow local Native Americans to drink at this tavern. Were the Puritans drinkers? I think they had beer. Okay. I think it was mostly a beer thing, probably more out of necessity than anything. But this was considered incredibly liberal and absolutely unthinkable. It was kind of like someone during Deep South segregation allowing African Americans to eat at the same lunch counter as white folks. Stupidly, of course, it just wasn't done. So this is going to be a story about how all the natives uh, staged a sit-in and peaceful protests and uh, bus uh, boycotts? No, but if you consider the times, these Native Americans were seen as godless people, and most of the townspeople were not interested in palling around with them, especially considering how tribes had wiped out many colonial settlements in Maine already. Right, and we talked about that last week, how that was that had built the kind of... Um built into the sense of paranoia and death around every corner that already existed here. Yeah, exactly. So to elaborate on that a little bit, um, the Salem people felt the Native American threat was ever nearing, and some of them involved in the trials even had experienced those horrors firsthand in Maine before moving to Salem. Oh. Maine was a less religious area, so perhaps those in Salem felt that the main locals had been punished for that fact, and it would happen to them too if they weren't devout enough. Though there was a treaty that ended the war between the natives and colonists called King Philip's War, which we mentioned, fighting resumed in 1688, and the economy was devastated, families were devastated, and Maine didn't begin to recover for decades after. Mm. Like we said before, this is part of the storm of witchcraft coined by Emerson Baker to describe the perfect storm of events that mixed together to violently birth the Salem witch trials. Right, because people had been burning witches for hundreds of years in Europe, but never with this ferocity. Mm -hmm. So keeping this whole context in mind, Giles Corey was apparently so affronted by the Proctor's progressive behavior in this case that he took his neighbor, John Proctor, to court. I don't know what for. What's the charge? Yeah, The the charge has to do with this, but I don't know what he could have possibly charged him with. He sued him over, hey, stop serving those Indians, basically. Exactly. That That was the suit. And obviously there wasn't much to charge him with, so Proctor won the case. Corey was also accused of committing arson against Proctor's home. Huh. Giles, that's not how insurance fraud works. Yeah. So perhaps this was top of mind for servant Mary Warren when she began her accusations against Martha Corey, because I'm sure she had heard the Proctors shit-talking the Corys in the house over a long period of time. During a church sermon given by guest minister Deodat Lawson... Love that name. (laughs) Deodat McCabe. It's a thought. I don't know. <laughs> I'll take dis or dat over day or dat. <laughs> dis o dat. Uh, so during this uh, sermon, the girls who were in attendance, of course, broke into their classic fits, and Abigail Williams claimed to see the specter of Martha Corey flying around in the air. They're flying again? Why are they always? That's the the most dangerous thing a witch can do. But that's like the first thing I would do if I had powers, so I get it. Yeah, you rub that. We talked about the flying ointment that you have to rub mm-hmm. on a chair. <laughs> so weird. Check out our werewolf episode. <laughs> Martha, who was also at this sermon, denied that she was flying around in the air. I guess her specter. But she was arrested the following day. Nah, you were flying. <laughs> We didn't see it, but we know. I'm pretty sure you were flying, lady. A teenager told us. (laughs) Her examination with Hawthorne and Corwin was the usual bullshit, but in Martha Corey, they had their first formidable sound-minded and bodied opponent. Someone who could actually... um... Well, Sarah Good sounds like she had it all going on. It's just nobody liked her. Yeah, but she was also a little 
mentally ill, it seems. She would talk to herself a lot. Oh, that's because she was a witch. <laughs> okay. Martha Corey denied seeing any devil's book nor entreating the girls to sign it. But her confidence in the truth uh, seemed to be a turnoff to the judges. Hmm. When she was asked why she was hurting the girls, notice not if, but right. why. A bit of a leading question. Objection! <laughs> Objection, Your Honor! She responded, I do not. Who doth? Pray give me leave to go to prayer. A.K.A. I have better things to do than all of this. Get me the fuck out of here! Mm -hmm. She was a strident lady, and I like her for that. <laughs> But unfortunately, she was married to a real piece of shit. Well, hold on. Again, Giles is lighting people's barns on fire. He's in court every other week. Committing this is a, murders. He's committing murders. This is a guy who always gets his way, and he's going to come in there and def stand by his woman. I know it. Giles was brought in to testify about his wife, and instead of defending her like a non-piece of shit, he said this, quote, Last Saturday evening, sitting by the fire, my wife asked me to go to bed. I told her I would go to prayer. And when I went to prayer, I could not utter my desires with any sense, not open my mouth to speak. My wife hath been wont to sit up after I went to bed, and I have perceived her to kneel down to the hearth as if she were at prayer, but I heard nothing. Oh, so he <laughs> testified that she was a witch, basically. Basically, yeah. He... He was saying that he felt she must have been doing some witchy work to prevent him from being able to say his prayers. And when he thought she was saying her prayers, she really wasn't. Take my wife, please. <laughs> I don't know, ma'am. So, uh, no thanks to her husband. They put you in jail right away. The next accusation was made by Abigail Williams against Rebecca Nurse, an even less likely culprit in the eyes of the village. Nurse was quite old at the time of her accusation, around 71. Yeah, we've just gotten into, like, fully just old elderly women now. <laughs> yeah, she was practically ancient by 1692 standards. She had originally settled in Salem Town with her husband Francis and extensive family. She was... Very blessed by the fact that most of her children didn't die young, as many did back in the day. In 1678, the nurses were given the opportunity to lease to own a 300-acre farm over on the Salem Village side. Great deal. Yeah. Lease to own, that's better than rent control. <laughs> and this farm, known as the Rebecca Nurse Homestead, is one of the few contemporary structures still standing today from the trial times. And it's located in present-day Danvers, Massachusetts. Again, that's the same area that Salem Village used to be. The nurses soon became pillars of the Salem Village community. They regularly attended church. And Francis was often asked to mediate disputes between villagers. Super respected. The nurses did remain members of the Salem Town Church even after their move. And I can't quite find whether they had partaken in the halfway covenant or they had become full members of the church via the public confession. I couldn't figure it out. But either way, they moved fluidly between the churches and were very respected aside from the fact that a few years prior to the trials, the nurses had taken in a Quaker orphan whose deceased parents had been friends of theirs. Well, that sounds nice. Yeah, 9.99 .99 times out of 10, this would see, be seen as like an absurd act of kindness and charity. But of course, in this case, even the most saintly acts would be twisted to be evil. How? How in this case? Well... Because he wasn't a Puritan boy? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically because this was a Quaker child. The Quakers believed everyone was blessed and pure through God. Pretty nice. But the Puritans believed everyone was essentially a sinner, and only those who adhered to the Puritan views would be saved. Right, but why, why doesn't bringing one of those children in just, why doesn't that just mean, hey, we've got another Puritan now? Because I guess once a Quaker, always a Quaker, and it was seen... Look at him. Look at him <laughs> munching on those oats. And them kind of bringing him into the community was seen as something dark, especially when added to the fact that the nurses simply never fully converted from the Salem Town Church to the Salem Village Church. 
Now, I think this is generally just a case of like who you tithe to and on what, I don't know, town directory your name is listed. So it is about money? I think that might be part of it. And there was also the fact that Francis Nurse was not a fan of Reverend Samuel Paris and was joined together with those who didn't want him as minister of Salem Village anymore. So it's money. It's like, are we not good enough for you? Also, there's this Quaker running around for some reason. So even though she's this very devout and saintly woman, they somehow managed to twist it into, oh, she's doing bad things. Well, that's like who... um hadn't was it Sarah Good who had like gotten married to her indentured servant and that was one of the big That was Osborne, yeah. Sarah Osborne. That was one of the big points against her was like she look at her, she She fell in love. Fuck she, her, yeah. She, she married her employee for love. <laughs> she lived a God forbid a romantic comedy. <laughs> at the time of the accusations, Nurse was very ill and nearly deaf. She was brought in for questioning soon after Martha Corey was, but her interrogation kind of started okay with her professing her innocence, but then during the proceedings, someone new to our story chimed in. Are these uh, interrogations done privately in a room with like a bag full of bars of soap, or is it like huh. full covenant confession it's, out in front of the town? It's both towns. I mean, I think they said something like 600 people showed up to the first hearing. Wow. It was something to do. Shit was boring. Right. It's like that John Mulaney bit about people would just go watch boats. Yeah. It's like, well, what else are you going to do? Of course. So at this point, Ann Putnam Jr.'s mom, old senior, got into the action. As far as I could tell, she was the oldest afflicted girl, so to speak, of the trials. She was about 30 at the time, my age. Oh, that's not a girl. No, but... Still Not young. <laughs> Still young. I mean, the other girls, some of them were like 20. She was also a respected member of the Putnam family. She apparently came down with the same issues as her daughter, and during the interrogation professed that Rebecca Nurse had tried to get her to sign the devil's book and had attacked her via specter several times. Okay, why is she doing this? Teenagers are horrible. I never have a problem believing that a girl between the ages of nine and like 17 did something horrible that ended someone else's life. I believe it of all of them. But uh, but why did this adult woman do this? Well, some people think it might have to do with land. Maybe they wanted the nurse's land, wanted to get rid of them somehow. It's not entirely clear. Nurse countered to Ann Putnam Sr. that, quote, I am as innocent as the child unborn, but surely what sin hath God found out in me unrepented of that he should lay such an affliction on me in my old age? She's like, God, are you kidding me? Pretty much. Oh, in such an affliction, meaning you. Yes. You people. Putnam Sr. was eventually carried out, having gone into some sort of shock or a trance. And the magistrates were stumped on how such a godly woman as Rebecca Nurse could be a witch. And unlike their guilty till proven innocent mindsets for the first four, kind of struggled to believe that she had done the things she was accused of. Great. So Rebecca's in the clear. Finally, calmer heads have prevailed. Well, they did tell Rebecca that if she was innocent, they prayed God would show her innocence. For it is a sad thing to see church members accused. Hathorne. Hawthorne's sister herself, Elizabeth Porter, was a close friend of Rebecca's and one of her most steadfast defenders. And you might remember that the Porters are the rich. They're the richest in the town. They have the most land. And who's got the second most land? Putnam's. Mm hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. But his sister's closeness to Rebecca didn't prevent John Hawthorne and Jonathan Corwin from ruling that she should go to Salem prison to await trial. And the evidence, the evidence here is only like eyewitness testimony of people who say they saw spirits. Yeah. And you know, the girls flailing about in the courthouse. Spectral evidence. Mm -hmm. 
that's going to be something we get into heavily in part three. Very exciting yeah. for the real trials. Mm -hmm. After this point, Reverend Paris, fighting to make sense of how such a seemingly pious woman could also be a witch, sermonized that, like the Apostle Judas, Nurse could, for all outward appearances, be a follower of God, but inwardly be a traitor. A real Judas, no. <laughs> Murder. Nurse's sister, Sarah Cloyce, stormed out of the service at this point, which would cast suspicion on her when she was accused down the road. All three of the, well, it's not the nurse sisters, but Rebecca and both of her sisters would end up accused. This sermon failed to convince many members of Salem Village, and 39 of the most prominent members of the community signed a petition on Rebecca Nurse's behalf, attesting to their belief in her godliness and innocence. Okay, so no, so you've got like two teenage girls who say that she did this stuff. Everyone else in the town says let her go. Well, not everyone, but a lot of important people, and interestingly, Many signers of this petition were members of the Putnam family, to which accuser Ann Putnam Sr. belonged. It was weird. Another were like, don't listen to mom. <laughs> Pretty much. Another signer appeared to be Joseph Herrick, whose relative Sarah Good had already been accused and escaped his barn and then got back again. So we'll get into more of the accusations and interrogations. After the break. Ooh, accusations. Interrogations. Sweet sensations. This series is sponsored by things to do in Salem.com. After learning all about the Salem witch trials during this two-parter, you may find yourself hankering to visit the witch city and experience Salem for yourself. When planning your trip, your first visit should be thingstodoinsalem.com. Created by Salem expert Elise Grimm, Things to Do in Salem packs all the information you need for the perfect trip to the witch capital. Choose your accommodations from a great list of hotels, inns, and Airbnbs. Fill up your itinerary with attractions, shopping, and events. Pick out the perfect restaurants for every meal and book a tour to get you familiar with the area. Heck, you can even plan your wedding if you're so inclined. This year, Things to Do in Salem even has a fall guide for if you're itching to visit before Halloween season is over. The fall guide includes over 10 years of Elise's research in the best Salem has to offer, October events for 2021, a full copy of her workbook, and a discount for a virtual tarot reading. This guide is a whopping 35 pages of trip planning perfection, now available for only $25. Find the guide in the shop section of the site, and listeners of Ain't It Scary can get 10% off either the fall guide or workbook separately by using the code Ain't It Scary at checkout. The promo code is valid until November 1st, 2021, so get in before Halloween is over. Personally, we used things to do in Salem to plan our Salem trips even way before we met Elise, and it's been an invaluable tool in getting the most out of every visit. Make sure you head over to thingstodoinsalem.com today to make your witch city dreams a reality. Welcome back. When last we left you, Rebecca Nurse had just joined the ranks, uh, maybe the most respectable member of uh, the Salem community so far, mm -hmm. who had been caught up in this uh, tidal wave of accusations that was quickly building. Uh, Carrie, what happened next? Well, literally the day after Rebecca Nurse's examination. Examination? Uh, was that just interrogation? Or no, was interrogation that like a... hearing, you know, that prelimi pre preliminary it wasn't one of the, like, we're looking for witch marks. Do you have a birthmark on your uh, pubic <laughs> no. area? Ew, no, this was just in the meeting house. The day after that, John Proctor came across Samuel Sibley, he of the walking stick battle with Elizabeth Hubbard's specter. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and he inquired to Samuel how things were going in town. Sibley was like, um, not good, John. 
and Proctor told Sibley that he was heading to pick up his servant, Mary Warren, from doing her testimony. Proctor stated, quote, I'd rather have given up money than get her involved in these examinations. I should just beat the devil out of her. Hmm. I think that line is in um, The Crucible, isn't it? Mm-hmm. He also called Mary a jade, which was a term for a worn out horse. I'm not sure if this was like a sexual reference, like calling her a, a worn out whore. girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sibley was like, It is a whore, sir. <laughs> Sibley was like, oh, okay. And he took note in Proctor's dismissal of the witchcraft trials and basically his saying that this was all BS and he knew Mary's afflictions were also BS. Right. So he's basically just bitching about, I'm fed up with, with, yeah. with the girl. Uh, and the whole shenanigans. He's over it. Mm -hmm. Proctor now, why is that? Why is Proctor particularly, do you think, j just on a, on a moral basis, seeing that this is really dumb and dangerous he wasn't incredibly religious and like we saw before he was more progressive than most people in the town so i think he just saw it as ridiculous and possibly dangerous but i don't think he was taking it seriously at the time because he knew mary um she was his servant he probably thought she was a silly young girl and why would anyone believe her about anything Sounds like a good guy. Uh, who do you cast as a, as a John Proctor? Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. Good choice. <laughs> Proctor brought Mary Warren home and beat her as promised for speaking out in the trials. Well, he did say. <laughs> he warned her. A few days later, later, Mary Warren, somehow cured, returned to town with a written prayer request that she affixed to the town's notice board. <laughs> Cured of the beating or cured of the afflictions? Cured of the afflictions By thanks the beating. to the beating, yes. She was requesting prayers of gratitude for her miraculous healing from the fits, which she attributed to God's intervention. But as we said... Was, God in the form of fucking John <laughs> Putnam's <laughs> fists crashing down on her head. It was most likely because she didn't want to keep getting beaten by Proctor. Reverend Paris read the note to the congregation, but instead of praising God for his healing of Mary, wondered aloud if she had switched sides due to the devil promising her relief if she did. Uh, meaning, it did Mary, did your boss tell you he would stop punching you in the face if you, <laughs> Mary, you're covered in bruises? Uh, but was more John of smart? Like... Did John do the pillowcase full of oranges? Jesus. <laughs> smart. Ugh. The old Bing Crosby. The old Bing Crosby. Oh, well, you got to make sure they don't have bruises on them, don't you know? Ba ba ba. Ba ba ba. Ba ba ba. Anyway, it was. Was that a good Bing? It was a good blue. <laughs> it wasn't that he was asking about Proctor. He was asking if the devil, her master, the devil, <laughs> of course, had promised her. That she would stop having her fits and such and being tormented by other witches if she just crossed over to the witchy side. Because again, they can't just take something at face value of, it's a miracle. It's more like, there has to be something dark about this. But also it like, institutionally makes it really hard for anyone to pull back once they step a toe into this. It's like yeah, very it's, dangerous it... now for Mary to pull back. It's very interesting how that works. I wonder if that's going to play a role in this. I don't think so. <laughs> so she was like, wait, no, that is so not what I meant. And someone, some in the congregation questioned her, you know, vocally, and felt that her answers indicated that she was saying the group of accusing girls had lied. Are you saying the group of accusing <laughs> girls lied? Well, She's like, yes. <laughs> I don't think it's... Uh, that up front, but she did state things like they, quote, did but dissemble, which meant something like to deceive, disguise, or pretend, according to Emerson Baker's interpretation. Yeah, dissemble is just like spreading information. It could be true or false, I guess. But I think in the way that she meant it here, that's how he felt she meant it, was they were pretending, they were bullshitting. This... <laughs> 
accusation, I guess, that she probably wasn't meaning to make, ended up pissing off the other girls in her group, understandably. You don't say. And it got her into further trouble. But first, Mary's employer, her other one, Elizabeth Proctor, was being accused. Oh, this is why John's... um... It's all happening. Nothing to it. I can't emphasize enough how everything is happening at the same time. So it's like the day after Elizabeth's accused, pretty much. Oh, so ju- this is more like, if anything, this is retaliation like for initial... John being so anti-witch trial. It's not, yeah, this isn't the reason he's so anti-witch trial. There were initial rumblings about Elizabeth, but then there were official accusations. And it's all happening in like the space of a week. Unlike in the play The Crucible, where Abigail Williams is aged up and made a former mistress of John Proctor... It is a whore, sir! (laughs) You love that. She's the one that accuses Elizabeth first, but in real life, she... um, In real life, Elizabeth was first accused by Mercy Lewis, then a few days later by Abigail, who said that Elizabeth Spector was pinching her and tearing at her bowels. At her bowel? Like, just making her poop? (laughs) I don't know. Like, I've got Sounds th- like Taco Bell to me. like, I've had the shits for two days. I think it's Elizabeth. <laughs> she also said she saw both of the Proctor's specters. Uh, oh, so John's getting involved here, too. Witching it up. Yeah. In April, 31 men from nearby Ipswich filed a petition much like that of Rebecca Nurse, attesting to the upstanding character of John of El- and Elizabeth Proctor, and denying they'd ever witness anything that would suggest the two were practicing witchcraft. These are folks from Ipswich. Yeah, neighboring town. Probably one of the ones that had broken off from Salem Village initially. Elizabeth herself was 41. She was the third wife of John Proctor, whose first two wives had died, and she was pregnant with her sixth child. Nothing suspicious about those deaths, was there? Just people died a lot? Not these, but we're going to get into some other ones. Ooh. The biggest thing against Elizabeth was that her grandmother, Anne Bassett Burt, had been a Quaker, so, and a midwife. (laughs) Big nose. Wait, why the midwife? Were they considered, like, wizards? As a midwife, she was good at caring for those who were ill. And some felt that there must be something witchy about that. It was another twisting a positive of helping sick people into something somehow negative. You seem too helpful, and we really like the trend of everyone dying at age 30 around here, so... Yeah. Uh, so, Anne Burt was tried for witchcraft in 1669, and although she wasn't executed, once Eliz- Elizabeth started being accused, some remembered back to 30 years previously and thought maybe the grandmother had passed on her witchery after all. So it's a genetic thing? Hey, do, do people at this time have any codified like system of beliefs about what a witch is or does? Oh, or... it's very flexible. Yeah, I would imagine. There's a lot of devil's books. There's a lot of pinching and prodding by specters. And then everything else is pretty flexible. Around this time, Deodat Lawson published his notes on the hearings so far, and this prompted those in the governor's office to take what was going on in Salem more seriously and plan to attend the next interrogation in person. We'd better, we'd better put a thumb on the scales and make sure things go totally nuts. We probably should have some eyes on this. Spurred on by these bigwigs heading to his little town, Hawthorne issued arrest warrants for Elizabeth Proctor and Sarah Cloyce, who you might remember as the sister of Rebecca Nurse, the one who had stormed out of the Salem Village sermon denouncing Rebecca. Right. Soon after this, both Anne's Putnam and Tichuba's husband, John Indian, claimed that John Proctor had attacked all of them as well, via Spectre. John Indian said this? Mm Mm-hmm. So just any yeah, if if you get accused long enough, you will just go, yep, point, right over there. You point it at someone else, at least it's not pointing at you. Abigail Williams also claimed that a whole group of witches had invaded Samuel Paris, her uncle's parsonage, and had a devil's supper of wine and red bread. Did she see this? And why is the bread always red? It's so stupid. It's so childish to go, oh, and they have, it's like church, but the bread is red. It's the exact, that's it. That's it. It's 
the idea of the inverted communion mass, kind of like in the Satanic Panic with the black masses. It's instead of this beige communion bread, it's red bread because it's spooky and of the devil. The priest wears a cross row, a a black robe, and the cross is upside Mm -hmm. down, and we all stand on our heads. Mm -hmm. And everyone has fun instead of being bored and falling asleep. (laughs) That's the most sinful. (laughs) Abigail said that this Devil's Supper wasn't only comprised of the nine total people Tituba had seen in the Devil's Book, but rather around 40. 40? Mm -hmm. This was a huge step up. And just like Tituba's testimony that there were six more witches in the community that started to amp up the hysteria in the first place, this would help push it into overdrive. Yeah, because now there's dozens of witches living among you. Mm Mm-hmm. Mercy Lewis and Ann Putnam Jr. also claimed to see similar visions. They didn't want to be outdone and just added more fuel to the fire. The deputy governor, Thomas Danforth, along with his assistants, attended the Cloyce slash Proctor interrogation, which was moved to Salem Town due to the esteemed attendees. And I also think that there were just tons of people at these things now. Like too many for our little meeting house that's on a covered bridge or whatever t- stupid thing. <laughs> yeah. Also likely due to these attendees, the afflicted girls went into high gear with the hysterics, going into fits, writhing on the floor, screaming, and insisting they were currently being tortured by Cloyce and Proctor. And Cloyce and Proctor are sitting in the court just like hands folded oh. and going, what, what, what? <laughs> They're specters, Sean. You know, it's just, like, again, like our werewolf episode, sending out your spirit sometimes mm-hmm. as an animal uh, to do Satan's work. Cloyce actually fainted at one point during all the hysterics. And during his testimony, John Indian stated that both Sarah Cloyce and Elizabeth Proctor had tried to get him to sign the devil's book, as they were wont to do which prompted Elizabeth's husband, John, sitting in the crowd, to stand and proclaim that he would beat the devil out of the slave. Out of John Indian? Yeah, so a little different than what Giles Corey was thrown down before. Yeah, John is always just... his. He's ready to fight. His go-to is just punching the devil <laughs> out of people. Mm-hmm. Abigail and Anne Putnam Jr. then cried out and went to fits, saying they were currently being bewitched by John Proctor and his wife. He's punching me so he is. <laughs> Proctor was like, uh, no. But Abigail continued to claim that Proctor's specter was attacking other young women, including Bathshua Pope. Bathshua? Now that sounds like a demon's name from Diablo, <laughs> mm-hmm. too. And Sarah Bibber, who promptly responded with fits as if it were really occurring. So it's the ultimate improv yes and yes they're all yes anding each mm-hmm. other and, and yes anding john proctor into jail in a second mm-hmm. proctor was dragged forward to face the judges and speak for himself just from the crowd like he was there mm-hmm. he wasn't like on well not, it wasn't a trial but he wasn't there to have a hearing His i'm wife not was. on trial you're all on trial <laughs> you can't handle the truth he was told to recite the lord's prayer because there was this Puritan assumption that no witch would be able to recite it perfectly from memory. Something you would presume all Puritans would be able to do, because right. all they friggin' do is pray <sighs> and eat, Seriously. like, apples and potatoes, I guess? I guess. Either due to poor speaking or poor hearing, it was recorded that Proctor said, Hallowed be thy name, instead of hallowed. They've all got these, like... It's so dumb. These it's so dumb. Concrete, like old timey Massachusetts mm-hmm. mouths. Hollow name. name. <laughs> and it was basically good enough for Hawthorne and Corwin. And John Proctor officially became the first man to be accused of witchcraft, and along with his wife and Sarah Cloyce, was imprisoned for trial. Yeah, witch trials throughout history uh, affected women more often than men. Um, women tend to have a lot less power. And tended to have a lot less power, especially back then. Uh, interestingly, the Valet Witch Trials, those first ones I mentioned, were mm-hmm. like 60% men. I don't know if I mentioned that in the uh, werewolf episode. No, I don't think you did. And, and in this case, um, it's pretty equal opportunity for who actually got executed. Lots of guys, too. Mm. Soon after these three were taken away to jail, Ann Putnam Jr. officially accused Giles Corey, and he had 
also been mentioned at the previous hearing as being in cahoots with witchcraft with his wife. Wait, he accused his wife. They brought him in to testify against his I wife, know. and he was like, yeah, cool. Hang her. <laughs> Ain't that a bitch. Yeah. Giles. It makes no sense. None of it makes sense. But he went to jail. So John Proctor, you're screwed. Husbands are, are not getting off easy here. John Proctor uh, defends his wife to the death, and it will be to the death. Uh, Giles Corey hangs his out to dry completely, and he's the only one, it seems like, who hangs somebody out to dry and then just, um, well, spoilers on what happens to Giles Corey. There's a lot, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of guilt by association in the accusations, and we're actually going to get into a case of that now. The next two to be accused were 14-year-old Abigail Hobbs and Bridget Bishop, but first we'll talk about Abigail. As a child, she had lived in nearby Topsfield and was the subject of many rumors. Rumors. Like she was disobedient and rude. She laid out in the forest alone at night. How dare you? And she took the Lord's name in vain. Worse. Apparently, some of these rumors were true. And at the very least, she was spreading them herself about herself. (laughs) Oh, she's a real rebel. This is a real Damien... Uh, Damien Eccles. Yeah, Damien Eccles. It really is. I mean, to me, she's clearly acting out. She was a turbulent teenager, and she had come from a place of recent intense trauma. Her family had moved from Topsfield, Massachusetts, to Falmouth, Maine, when she was four. Now, remember those I, Native American attacks? I was going to say, I've never heard of Falmouth, Maine. Was it <laughs> destroyed by Native American attacks? Well, it wasn't a great time for them to move to the area. Abigail's mother and siblings were all killed, and her father lost their land. So he remarried a woman from Maine named Deliverance, and they all moved back to Topsfield after this. Those Puritan names. Oh, this isn't even like the craziest one. There's like Remembrance. It's all Jebediah. (laughs) A lot of Hezekiahs and Chastities Mm -hmm. as well. Mm Mm-hmm. The Hops family were a part of a large group of refugees leaving Maine after the devastation of the conflicts to settle in, or in this case, settle back in, to the Essex County area of Massachusetts, of which Salem was a part, because this was like the most northeast area in Massachusetts. At her examination, Abigail Hobbs readily confessed that she had been wicked, going on to say that she had seen the devil in the form of dogs and many creatures and had put her hand on the devil's book years ago back in Maine. Why? This is, she just thinks she's being badass? I think it is a Damien Eccles situation, for sure. He's like, actually, that's a misconception, but it does come (laughs) from the word witchcraft. (laughs) The devil had also appeared to her at her home in Topsfield to offer her magical powers, according to her. (laughs) And this was enough for the magistrates, and she was sent to prison. Would you like to live deliciously? There's a lot of that. I think that was specifically, in in the movie The Witch, inspired by a lot of what the devil's promising people here. Abigail's stepmother, Deliverance, and Father William were arrested on suspicion of witchcraft three days later. So again, guilt by association. Deliverance, having come from the less religious Maine, had never been baptized, and that was suspicious enough to these people, because I can't really quite find further reasoning as to why they were arrested, well, accused and arrested as well, aside from the fact that their daughter had apparently joined up with the devil. Right. Well. <laughs> it's just like, well, she did it. You guys probably did it. Like you say, guilt by association. Do you think she was just trying to get her parents killed? <laughs> I don't know, maybe her stepmother at the very least. She sounds like a real hot topic teen. (laughs) I would never have done that. I was one of those. I would never have done that. She was wearing a corset this whole time, (laughs) and it was red or purple. Yeah, everyone was wearing a corset, Sean. Ish, right? Something like that. Yeah, with a lot of other layers. (laughs) Yeah. Bridget Bishop, who was about 60 years old, had been charged and acquitted of witchcraft years before. During her second marriage to Thomas Oliver, Thomas died, and Bridget was accused of bewitching him to death. Is this the guy who, didn't he fall off a roof? Bridget Bishop's husband? Fall off a roof. 
I thought I, I thought he had like he was repairing the roof and he fell off or something. Might be. We've been on a lot of ghost tours in Salem. We might have heard that story. Seems like a good way for a witch to kill somebody. It looks like an accident. Mm-hmm. Because hear me out, it, it probably was, was. It was an accident. Thanks to the lack of evidence, which should have been the standard for all the trials to come, she was acquitted at this time, but the stain of the accusation still tarnished her name like it did Elizabeth Proctor from her grandmother's trial. That's strange, because these don't seem like gossipy people. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird how that works, that they think they're better than everyone else, but really they're just as shady as all the others. Bridget married Edward Bishop, who resided in Beverly, a town near Salem, in 1687. Alongside Edward, Bridget helped run two taverns and had a tendency for being a loudmouth, confrontational, and wearing exotic clothes in bright colors. She was a strident woman. She's the best. (laughs) We're big fans of Bridget Bishop. I hope she did kill her first husband. (laughs) On the date of her hearing, along with Abigail Hobbs, Giles Corey, and Mary Warren, she was accused of bewitching Abigail Williams, Ann Putnam Jr., Mercy Lewis, Mary Walcott, and Elizabeth Hubbard, all young women in the group of afflicted girls. She's been busy, huh? Clearly. She was jailed after a brief interrogation, along with two other members of her family, uh, Edward and Sarah Bishop. So I think that one of them is her husband. And the other might be a daughter. Hmm. And these, like the Hobbeses, were also suspected of witchcraft by association with Bridget. Now, Giles Corey, as we know, had initially failed at not being a jerk by coming out against his wife at her hearing. Or succeeded at being a jerk, which (laughs) was like his job almost. Yeah, well, to him it was. He was about to receive a large dose of karma because he was accused himself shortly after. And then, as we saw before, Abigail Hobbs had also named him during her portion of the hearing. The girls were asked, which of you have seen this man hurt you? To which Mary Walcott, Mercy Lewis, Ann Putnam Jr., and Abigail Williams all responded to the affirmative. None of them could show any injuries or (laughs) say how or... But they just Sometimes he- they could show injuries, but they were likely things that they had done to themselves, like hiding their face and biting their own arm or scratching themselves. Elizabeth Hubbard was also asked the same question, but was an- unable to answer due to having a fit. So they probably counted that in the yes column anyway. Right. Giles was accused of bringing the devil's book to them, trying to make them sign the usual shenanigans. The girls continued to have fits during his interrogation, and he was also accused of associating with his wife's witchy ways. Journalists, we have a special jail for journalists. Mary Warren, for her part, had apparently not received the grateful prayers of the town because she was put under examination and also in prison soon after her little moment at the weekly church service in April. After basically calling them liars, or at the very least pretenders, her former gal pals turned on her and began to say that she was attacking them too. I'm going to say this again. I can't stress enough how fast this was all moving. For reference, Elizabeth Proctor and Sarah Cloyce were accused between March 28th and April 3rd. Mm -hmm. Their hearing took place on April 11th. Mary... Warren had indicated the girls were lying in early April, and Hobbs, Bishop, Corey, and Warren were questioned on April 19th. This is like a wild month. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) about a month has passed, yeah, since the first accusations. Considering how dull and routine Puritan life was, this was the equivalent of having a crazy party every single day. (laughs) Which trials, man, at least it's something to do. Warren started out strong during her interrogation, demanding that she was innocent, but eventually turned back to her old ways and began herself falling back into fits, which usually followed the other girls in the courtroom. Why? Yes, and, baby. She was seeing the, which way the wind was blowing. Does she get out of this? I'll, I'll get there. I think she started to sense that the safer place was to be back with the accusers rather than turning on them and becoming one of the accused. Right. Her fits were so violent that she had to be removed from the courtroom for a time, and the magistrates held a private meeting with her, wherein she began to... They're going, cut the shit. (laughs) 
she began to confess to witchcraft, and it was noted that not one of the sufferers was afflicted during her examination after once she began to confess, though they were tormented before. Basically, once she started to confess, they all calmed down. So it seemed like proof. Like, oh, see? The fact that she's confessing, it's taking away their fits. Yeah, but you would think that they would be getting upset, like the demons would get upset about the confession? or I'm sure that they will at some point, but <laughs> right now this is how that evidence was being used. In prison days later, she really began to change her tune, implicating the proctors indirectly in the Salem witchcraft and accusing them of performing certain deeds without full-on saying that they were a witch and wizard. By the end, much like Tichuba had, through her extensive confession and testimony against other witches, she had ended up saving her own life by reverting back to the side of the accusers. She was later released from prison in June, around the time the executions began. And by then it was too late for John Proctor to give her the uh, beating she so obviously needed this time. <sighs> yeah, I couldn't. Couldn't hold it against him if he wanted to do that at this point. Yeah. Disclaimer, don't beat teenage girls, obviously. Yeah. Other folks who were accused... Don't beat anyone. Good plan. Other folks who were accused and arrested around late April included Mary Easty, the other sister of Rebecca Nurse and Sarah Cloyce, and the Putnam slave Mary, who was known as Mary Black, much like Tichuba's husband was known as John Indian. Right. On April 22nd, a mass hearing was held for Mary Eastie, the Hobbses, the Bishops, Sands Bridget, alongside Mary Black, Nemiah Abbott, Sarah Wilde, and Mary English. The most explosive part of the hearing was the interrogation of Mary Eastie, which prompted a bit of Simon Says from the afflicted girls. What do you mean? If Eastie claps, clasped her hands together, so did Mercy Lewis, claiming she was unable to release her hands until Eastie did so to her own. Oh, a little puppeteering. That's so stupid. When Eastie inclined her head, the girls accused her of trying to break their necks. Mercy Lewis stated that Eastie's specter had climbed into her bed and laid her hand upon her breasts, which was an oddly sexual turn that I don't really see had been previously taken by one of the girls to one of the women does that continue i mean does, does it continue to be like and they were trying to do hot <laughs> lesbian stuff with me i don't know i mean I've there been was thinking about it all night <laughs> there had been accusations of nudity like sarah good and consorting with the devil which i always assumed to be like oh they were also consorting with the devil hmm. Uh, but Mary Wolcott backed this claim up, saying Eastie had undertaken, quote, a choking of Mercy Lewis and pressing upon her breast with her hands. And I saw her put a chain about her neck and choked her. And she told me that she would kill her this night if she could. Oh, so she's picking up what these girls are putting down. <laughs> I guess. Though Eastie defended herself eloquently, telling the magistrates that, Sir, I have never complied, but prayed against him, the, the, Satan, all my days, I have no compliance with Satan in this. What would you have me do? I will say it if it was my last time. I am clear of this sin. She was still jailed to await trial. Nehemiah Abbott was released, the only person to be released after refusing to confess. Again, it's it doesn't go in deep as to why he was. Weird. Yeah. The Hobbses were brought back to prison. Mary English would also be sent to prison, along with later her husband, Philip. Mary Black was sent to prison, how and Sarah Wilds was as well. Is this the prison in Boston still? How crowded is this prison getting? Yeah, so at this point, it was starting to get overcrowded in Salem, so they were being transferred to Boston. Hundreds of people eventually would be imprisoned, so... Not a lot of space, especially if one of the prisons is also a barn in and, Ipswich. And we haven't described the Salem jail, but we've stood in a recreation of it. It's hideous, yeah. We will talk about it a little bit. It's not good. Sarah Wilds, one of the jailed people, was... Well, she had a reputation of being a nonconformist in Puritan, Massachusetts. Thought of as being glamorous and forward as a young woman. Sarah Bad, if you will. <laughs> Sarah Wilds. 
She was certainly hot to trot because in 1649 she had been sentenced to a whipping for fornication with one Thomas Wordwell. Go Thomas! And in 1663 she was charged with wearing a silk scarf. Oh, how dare you! Of course, this was a long time before and at the time of the accusations, Wilds was 65, but memories were long in colonial Salem. There were some interesting politics at work in Wilds' case, which will be important later because she, well, she didn't end up having very good luck for the rest of the hysteria, I'll say. A lot of these people didn't. (laughs) Sarah had married an Englishman named John Wilds only seven months after his previous wife's death, which left a bad taste in John's former in-laws' mouths. Further, John had even testified against his former wife's brother in a treason trial. These in-laws were the Goulds, and they happened to be related to the Putnam family, who were among the chief accusers during the Salem witch trials. Yeah, but this is different. This is we're looking for justice (laughs) and safety for our community. It's not about just old grievances in a personal way. So I'm sure she'll be fine. A lot of these were about old grievances in a personal way, unfortunately. (laughs) Sarah had already been accused of being a witch by John's former sister-in-law and others years beforehand. And like we've seen before, these charges stick around like a bad rash. During the examination, Anne Putnam Jr., again a relative of the family who disliked the Wildses, testified that she had been tortured by Sarah Wilds and she had witnessed her torturing Mary Wolcott, Mercy Lewis, and Abigail Williams, the usual suspects. How old was Ann Jr.? She's like a teenager? Yes. Young teen, I believe. Deliverance Hobbs had also stated that Sarah had recruited her to attend a black mass, and Sarah had apparently offered to cease torturing Deliverance if she would sign the devil's book. Again with the book. It's always the book. Why do they all latch on? They all yes and this book to death. Because once the book is brought up and it's such a point in the early goings, it's the one thing that they can return to as like, well, this has been canon, right? This is part of the story that we're developing. As far as I can tell, the only person to be released this examine, examination day was Nemaya Abbott. And he was just, they were like, are you a witch? And he was like, no. And they were like, yeah, cool. Good enough. Within a week of this mass hearing, the next accusation would come, and this one was a shocker. Earlier, I had mentioned the visions of a red communion seen by Abigail Williams and others. Yes, of course. The uh, I, I think they were singing um, Stairway to Heaven backwards, <laughs> just the bridge mm-hmm. and the guitar solo. Mm-hmm. My sweet Satan. <laughs> During one of these visions, seen by Ann Putnam Jr., she was heard to exclaim, What, are ministers witches too? Everyone witnessing this fit was like, uh, say what now? Did Was it like a dead stop, pin drop moment? Yeah, record scratch. Mm -hmm. They didn't know if that was even possible. Soon after, this specter identified himself. It was George Burroughs the former Salem minister who had left to live in Maine. Oh, George, why did you come back? Well, he didn't. (laughs) You may recall from our first episode that Burroughs encountered many of the same problems Samuel Paris did in coming to Salem Village to preach, including townspeople refusing to pay his salary. Even worse, in 1681, his wife died suddenly, and John Putnam lent him money to pay for her funeral. But Burroughs was unable to repay the debt because, you know, no salary. So because of this, along with everything else, he peaced out and left Salem in 1683. So it was the porters who refused to pay his salary, right? But he owed a, he owed a debt to Putnam, and so he had to skip town. So yeah. he has no friends. Not really. Proctor, who's now in jail, maybe liked him. Probably. Seems like two guys that would get along. There were stories in Salem about how Burroughs had mistreated his wives and perhaps contributed to their deaths, and some of the girls and women accusing him may have been associated with those deceased wives, like former friends, things like that. Have you noticed there's a lot of vague talk about possibly contributing to deaths in this story? Like, how many murders just went (laughs) uninvestigated? A lot, I think. Or everything was seen to be a burner, one or the other. Well, I'm glad the judicial system was spending its time wisely on stuff like this, then. (laughs) 
One of the afflicted girls actually knew Burroughs very well, Mercy Lewis. George had met Mercy in Falmouth, Maine after a series of Native American attacks in 1676 pushed a group of refugees south to Essex County. Burroughs left the area too, and with him he brought Mercy Lewis, who was only three at the time and whose entire family had been decimated. It seems like Burroughs took the orphan under his wing and into his care. He eventually arrived with her in Salem Village when he became a minister. He left her there in 1683 when he returned to Maine, and she just was hired on as a servant for Thomas and Ann Putnam Sr. So it was kind of like she started to live her own life. Well, they Or they like inherited this human. I Maybe. George is like, hey, hold on to this for me. <laughs> It seems Lewis didn't retain gratitude for Burroughs rescuing her after her family's murders, because at this time she claimed to have been attacked by Burroughs' specter, who tortured her and offered to give her power in exchange for, you guessed it, signing the devil's book. Oh, this feels like daddy issues to me. This feels <laughs> like she was, he, this guy kind of abandoned her to flee his funeral deaths, mm. uh, went to a different Indian riddled state. He went to Maine, right? He went Back to Maine, yes. Uh, he was like, you know what? Getting chopped, getting my head chopped off or scalped or whatever is going to be better than hanging out with you, little girl. And well, then he leaves. Uh, that's how she saw it at yeah. the very least, yeah. Arrests had already been made outside of the Salem area, like the Hobbses and Topsfield, but arresting George Burroughs in Maine would be the furthest the community would go during the trials. A group of they, men... They actually did that? Mm-hmm. A group of men rode to Wells, Maine, where George Burroughs was located. Dog the bounty hunters out there. They found him and they arrested him oh, for questioning. Never mind. If they found him, Dog the bounty hunter was not out there. <laughs> for George's examination on May 9th, 1692, Judges Hawthorne and Corwin were joined by Samuel Sewell, a devout Puritan who had gotten involved in local politics in Boston and become an assistant magistrate and William Stoughton, an actual magistrate, who became the chief justice of the court of Oyer and Terminer for the Salem Witch Trials. If you, unlike me, with my useless knowledge, don't know what Oyer and Terminer is, uh, it's, yeah. it's Latin-ish for to hear and to determine. And this was the name given to courts of criminal jurisdiction in colonial America. And was the judge, was there like a jury at play at all here, or was the judge kind of the final arbiter? Uh, it would end up being a, a bigger group of judges in the actual trials. Before and during his interrogation, the judges found that Burroughs hadn't taken communion in such a long time that he couldn't recall when the last time was. This is, this is pretty witchy, right off the bat. Well, it's unheard of for a reverend, right? The girls were in attendance and their theatrics were at its peak, accusing him of killing his wives and of the wives' ghosts appearing right there during the examination and had also appeared previously as specters to the girls. Burroughs was also accused of possibly killing one or more of his children, so you know what that means. You're stealing, right to jail. You're playing music too loud, right to jail, right away. <sighs> Over the next month... Many more villagers were examined. Some of these were more prominent cases than others, but I'll begin by listing their names. Mm -hmm. Sarah Churchill, George Jacobs Sr. and his granddaughter Margaret, Roger Toothaker, Martha Carrier, John Alden, Wilmot Red, Elizabeth Howe, and the previously mentioned Philip English. Now back to Sarah Osborne, who had been in jail since the very beginning of the mess back in March, well, she was the first death of the Salem Witch Trials, indirectly, when oh. she, she died in a Boston prison on May 10th. Now, I said that we would talk a little bit about the prisons. Um, as you may know, Sarah had already been extremely ill, but the jails were just horrific places for anyone to be. They were full of illness lice, bad hygiene, you would basically poop in a bucket in a corner, terrible living conditions. And lots of people pressed together, right? Lots of right? people, yeah. And also, your family had to basically pay rent 
for you to stay there and for your food and any upkeep. They're like, oh, yeah. hey, you can, my family hasn't paid in a couple days. You guys going to kick me out anytime soon? Huh? Mm. Evict me? Huh? Yeah. They would just end up incurring debts, unfortunately. You were expected to pay for your own jail stay as if you had elected to stay in a nice Airbnb for the weekend. Yeah, but the beds are terrible and you're not getting Netflix in there. Yeah. So Sarah Osborne passed away. Mary Eastie oh, was... just from like exposure in the jail. Well, she was already very sick and there was no way she was going to last very long in these conditions. And the Massachusetts one had to be bigger and better than the Salem one, right? Mm-hmm. Mary Eastie was surprisingly released from prison a few days later for reasons that it seems we're unsure of. But her release encountered protests from her accusers, with Mercy Lewis claiming that Eastie's specter had returned to torment her when she was released. Well, that's that's not a good strategy after you get released. You shouldn't be sending your yeah. specter out that day. Mary was arrested again. And apparently her return to prison calmed Lewis's fits, because of course. Oh, well, there you go. George Jacobs Sr. was one of the oldest people to be accused in the witch trials, being 81 years old and having to use two wooden canes to help him walk. His servant, Sarah Churchill, who was 20, was the first accuser of his, and she was also a refugee from Maine. Was she getting paid? Or like when we say servant, she wasn't like a slave, right? I don't, I don't know if it's like an indentured servant sort of thing, or she would li she lived with him. Just so she gets room and board. Why does she want this guy dead? That's, that's what I'm asking. He probably wasn't very nice to her, just like John Proctor wasn't nice to his servant. Well, what are you talking about? He <laughs> beat the devil out of her whenever it was necessary. That's a service. Perhaps Sarah Churchill's paranoia from the native wars pushed her into her accusation because she revealed in May that George Jacobs Sr., his son, Jr., and his granddaughter, Margaret, had all practiced witchcraft and pushed her into making a pact with the devil. Oh, my God. Now, that's are you putting a target on your own back at that point? Are you going like, and by the way, you haven't asked, but I'm also a witch. Well, she, she did. And she was interrogated. But I think she probably had figured, well, if I nip this in the bud, cut it out, uh, cut it at the pass and say, hey, I'm a witch up front, I'm not going to get killed. Because who else is a witch? My boss. <laughs> Rumors spread that Jacob Sr. was using his walking sticks to try and beat the devil out of her, like John Proctor. Mm. Well, it worked. It worked for a little while for John Proctor. <laughs> And some of the girls said that they had seen Jacobs beating Sarah in the guise of his invisible specter. At his interrogation, Jacobs spat out the one-liner, You tax me for a wizard. You may as well tax me for a buzzard. I have done no harm. I like the wordplay there. He could have had a rap career if he was living now. You tax me for a wizard. Tax me for a buzzard. Yeah, it's, like, it's, good. it's not a rhyme, but it's maybe, a, maybe like a slant rhyme. Mm. He later retorted, well, burn me or hang me, I will stand in the truth of Christ. I know nothing of it. Now, that, I think, is off of Donda. <laughs> I think that's from the fifth track off Donda, Kanye West's new album. <laughs> Ready to die. Uh, later that day, Sarah Churchill apparently confessed to the niece of the tavern owner, Sarah Ingersoll, that she had lied about signing the devil's book. But Sarah Ingersoll's testimony to this fact was later simply ignored. Oh, good. So she did the right thing. She went to the authorities and said, hey, like this chick told me she's lying. And they were like, okay, whatever. Why? I mean, what, at a certain point, do you go like we've gone too far? They did. And it was much further after this. No, but I mean, too far to go back. Like, even like, yes, you go they like, were absolutely at that point. I maybe think. these people aren't witches. There's nothing we can do about it now. I think they were absolutely already there. The next day, at further examination, Margaret Jacobs confessed to witchcraft, convinced that this was the way to save herself. And again, she wasn't exactly wrong. And she also implicated her grandfather, George Burroughs, John Willard, and Alice Parker. George Burroughs was her grandfather or separate? Her grandfather, George Jacobs, and George Burroughs. Okay. Who... Uh 
putting your own fan like it's really shitty. I, I know you, you go like I listen. I get it. I mean, uh, he was he had already been accused, so maybe she was like, "Well, I'm not making it worse," but she made it worse. <laughs> yeah, only say people who've already already been accused, mm. and not your family, and not your family members. Several of these people were brought to the Boston jail thereafter to await trial. Margaret did recant her confession in mid-May, including saying that her grandfather was a witch or wizard. She took that back. And in a kind-hearted gesture, Jacobs, in response to this, inserted a line in his will, leaving his granddaughter an additional 10 pounds of silver. Like, pounds as in pence or whatever, not full-on LBS pounds. Is that a biblical reference? What did Judas get for betraying Jesus? Or was that like 20 pieces of oh, silver? Oh, yeah. It was more silver. Okay. It would have been cute if it was like, here's your <laughs> no. silver back. <laughs> she had been in the will before. It was a little complicated how it worked out because he had sons and stuff. So she wasn't getting a ton of stuff anyway. Right. No, but it would have, I'm just saying it would have been cute. If she's, she's in there, right? But then he's like, well, now you get this back too, Judas. <laughs> Judas, no. <clears throat> it seemed he forgave her, but his kindness would not help him in his later trial. Roger Toothaker was a physician who had lived in the Massachusetts Bay Colony since he was an infant. With that name, he should have been a dentist. Well, I'm sure he was. And apparently for several years before the trials, bragged to locals that he was great at detecting and punishing witches. And that he had taught his daughter Martha this trade. And she had herself killed a witch. This is weird. Hey, you want to hear about my daughter's murder? Yeah, he seems like a weird guy. Apparently, this upstanding anti-witcher didn't win anyone over with even this claim, because he was accused in May by Elizabeth Hubbard, Ann Putnam Jr., and Mary Walcott. Well, Mark- he is, you say anti-witcher, he is sort of a witcher, like Geralt of Rivia. Well, yes. Martha Toothaker was also arrested, along with her father, Roger, but released due to lack of evidence. Toothaker himself died in Boston jail in early June before he was able to stand trial from natural causes from being old and illness or malnutrition from being in jail. Mm. The same group, plus a girl named Susanna Sheldon, accused Martha Carrier, who lived in the nearby Andover, of witchcraft as well. They claimed she led a 300-strong army of witches and would use her powers to afflict and or murder people with terrible diseases. Wow. An army, huh? Mm -hmm. They even called her the Queen of Hell. And I'm really wondering what Martha did to get so far on these girls' bad sides. Satan's like, darling, I'm the Queen of Hell. (laughs) They also weren't the only ones. One neighbor complained that Martha's witchery had caused him to lose a fist fight to her son, Richard. Lose a fist fight? Mm -hmm. To her son, Mm -hmm. Richard. Richard. Because of someone else's witchery? Because of Martha, like, casting a hex on him. Others attributed deaths of their uh, livestock to Martha, saying she must have placed hexes on the animals. So? You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Undercook, overcook. Undercook, overcook. It's, um, <laughs> that is similar to the werewolf thing as well. In the, because that was witch trials, basically. Every time people's livestock disappeared, it was basically like, and Goody Bassett over there turned into a wolf and ate them. <laughs> sure. Goody it wasn't Bassett's just a, real... a regular wolf eating its regular prey. Goody Bassett's a real, well, real uh, witch from Stratford, Connecticut. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about her in the future. But now, Captain John Alden Jr. was also being accused. He was a seafarer, soldier, and politician, the son of original Mayflower Pilgrims. So he had a little cachet to his name. But he led a somewhat scandalous life and was accused of being a war profiteer, selling weapons to the enemy like the Native Americans the Salem villagers were so terrified of. And he would do this, apparently, for personal profit. Hey, it could be worse. Did you hear that guy uh, Proctor was selling him beer? (laughs) One of his accusers was Mercy Lewis, the girl who had lost her family to native attacks in Maine. So one has to wonder if her accusation of him was some sort of revenge against a man she saw as allied with her enemies. 
Alden, along with Philip and Mary English around the same time, ended up escaping the Boston jail where he was held during the night on horseback thanks to the help of some friends who assisted him in the escape, presumably bringing the horse. These three escapees, and again, I'm not sure if it was on the same night or different nights, they fled to the New York area to wait out the trials, which made, made them the luckiest victims of all. Because uh, they didn't become victims. Well, they were victims of circumstance, but they were not executed. They so. weren't murder victims. Yes. Wilmot Red, who was a woman, I didn't realize this, uh, was arrested in late May after accusations made by Mary Walcott and Mercy Lewis. The girls broke into fits during the examination, which be bewildered the Marblehead native, but since this was usually seen as enough proof by this kangaroo court, she was jailed to await trial. Same went for Elizabeth Howe from Topsfield, who was accused mainly by the Purley family of Ipswich, Massachusetts, whose 10-year-old daughter they claimed was being afflicted by Howe. Can you imagine just a couple of 16-year-old girls do like a color guard routine on the, <laughs> on the court bench and... Um... Yeah, and then you die. And then you die. <laughs> the Purley parents claimed that several doctors had told them their child was being possessed under an evil hand, and eventually this child wasted away until she died. I don't know if it was before or after the examination. It was a little foggy on that point, but they seemed to think it was Elizabeth Howe doing it. Now, to be fair, in the 1690s, this is what children did. <laughs> Just wasted away and died or had fits on the courtroom floor or one or the other. It was very popular at the time. Girls in the afflicted club in Salem Village also got in on the action against Howe, and despite Howe protesting that God knows I am innocent of anything in this nature, she was taken away. So here we end these initial hearings and find ourselves heading fast on a collision course with the deadliest hysteria in American history. Conveniently, that May, Sir William Phipps, the newly elected governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, arrived back in Boston from England with Increase Mather. Increase is another stupid name. The, I, the Puritans. <laughs> Increase Mather. Yeah, it's like, okay, and his son decrease? No, his son was cotton. That was dumb, too. Increase Mather was an influential Puritan clergyman and the president of Harvard College. And together they brought back a new charter that ended the 1684 prohibition of self-governance within the colony. So you guys can now do whatever you want? Well, this kind of meant in so many words, instead of depending on England to have to carry out their judicial trials, now they were able to oyer and terminer it up and do it themselves. And execute. And boy howdy, did they. So we'll begin with the first trial, that of Bridget Bishop on June 2nd, 1692, on our third and final part of the Salem Witch Trials series. Oh my god, and the blood is going to start coming down. Well, hanging, mostly. Yeah, figurative blood. Figurative blood. Probably some blood with Giles Corey. Definitely blood with Giles Corey. Spoiler alert. Um... This was fascinating, Carrie. Thank you. I think this is so important to give context to the deaths. Uh, we, we, we have a sense for these people as people now, probably more than I've ever. I mean, I, I thought I knew a good amount about this story. Me too. I mean, I, I hadn't all, I hadn't dove into all of the different people. I mean, I knew a lot about the ones from the Crucible because I had researched them and tried to get the actual historical context versus what Arthur Miller wrote, which again is an incredible drama. It's just not the most accurate. Probably what happened in the court and how he wrote that was pretty close because we do have those transcripts. But people like Wilmot Red and Martha Carrier, people like that I didn't know a lot about. And there are so many interpersonal conflicts and politics and the trauma of the main native american wars like i can't emphasize enough how much that really cast a shadow over these events and we never talk about it we talk about maybe ergot poisoning and we'll talk about the theories in, in the last episode but there's just so much trauma and darkness surrounding this town um 
And it seemed like they thought maybe by purging it in this way, it wouldn't drown them. But the problem was they were the darkness. But were there also like venal personal concerns, like literally... Like land seizing, disputes yes, and stuff? Seizing land and property. and I think there's some of that. Um, I'm going to try and dive into that a little deeper. But there's also personal disputes like Giles Corey versus John Proctor. And then they both end up in the shit. So it's like, well, no one wins in that case. Um, but yeah, I really wanted to, to provide the details here because, again, we always see, oh, here are the 20 people bunch of names everyone's named elizabeth or sarah or whatever it doesn't seem like real people anymore especially since this was so long ago but these were real people and um i probably would have been one of them at the time for i don't know wearing a scarf or something yeah or um talking to my dog like imagine people think you're a witch because you sing to your dog you would be so dead sean i don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Maybe you should ask Bo. There he was, just a trotting down the street, singing Pina Pina, he's a sweet little pig. We're going to skip our Halloween horrors this week and just go straight into our end credits. So that's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. Don't forget to screenshot your five-star reviews and share with us on social media for your chance to win a gift straight from us. Yeah, and special thanks to our sponsor for this series, Things to Do in Salem.com. We love you, uh, and always we love our patrons. The top tier ones would be Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakudis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. And if you want to find Kyle, you can check out the YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. He speaks intelligently about pop music. I'm a big fan. This has been a production of Longboy Media. Boy Media.